angry. All right, great. <laughs> so we're going to. Yes. John is an originalist when it comes to his. We're going to PC start game. up <laughs> again. Again with the webcast, so uh, everyone has to follow the same rules that we followed for the first panel, which means that folks in the audience should wait to speak until uh, they have a microphone in front of them and there will be roving microphones. So uh, same logistics as the last time, except everyone will speak for about five to seven minutes. Steve will keep the time. And I will interject probably after a few speakers because this, um, as was the last panel, will also be a lively panel, I'm sure, with opportunity for participation by panelists from panel one and from the audience more generally. So we will start with John Golden and move down. Uh, John, take it away. Okay. So uh, panel uh, is on oil state significance for the administrative state. And my basic answer is it depends. Um, <laughs> we don't know what motivated the justices to grant uh, full merits review in this case. So we don't know exactly what they're contemplating in terms of the, the nature of the particular outcome in this case or the general scope of what they might say about Article Three jurisprudence or uh, jury rights. Um, we do know that the law uh, in these areas is not a model of clarity and coherence. Uh, so there are many opportunities uh, for the Supreme Court to say something which could have a fair amount of significance uh, for the administrative state uh, generally. Uh, we could have some uh, clarification of this public versus private rights distinction to which the court often refers uh, with regard to the Article Three separation of powers issues. We could get clarification to the extent, uh, about the extent to which there are uh, important formal aspects of what the court has commonly characterized as a kind of pragmatic uh, separation of powers analysis. Um, we can get clarification, uh, as uh, Greg Riley suggested in the prior panel, of how uh, relevant historical uh, facts and concerns, historical uh, contingency is to um, the Article III analysis. Of course, we do know there's a historical test applicable in the uh, jury rights uh, situation. Um, and finally, we could also get clarification on the role of consent uh, with respect to uh, subjection to uh, a non-Article III adjudicator, and also what constitutes consent. There's some language in the Thomas B. Union Carbide case about how entry into a regulatory scheme, such as might be accomplished, you might think, by applying for a patent, uh, essentially uh, is a way of consenting to the procedures uh, put in place under that scheme. So there, there are many opportunities for the court to bring some uh, clarification to how the law works uh, quite generally in these areas. Um, a second point is that if the court does strike down inter partes uh, review, uh, that would be a, a quite extreme uh, step um, in uh, the, the history of jurisprudence of this area. It's probably the most extreme step since the Northern Pipeline decision a few decades ago. Uh, the courts generally, uh, when they raise concerns here, are often reluctant to question uh, Congress's decisions as to how legislatively uh, generated regimes are going to be administered. So it could, signi it could si signal a much more aggressive approach uh, to the Article III uh, separation of powers questions. Um, on the other hand, uh, for the reasons, again, that Greg indicated, the court could write a relatively narrow, historically uh, conditioned opinion that might be relatively peculiar to patent law because patent law does, uh, because of its predating the modern administrative state, allow the opportunity for that. Um, and then the general significance might not be so great. Um, beyond this, there's a question of what the fix would be. And um, we saw uh, that raised in the last panel with the opportunities this could offer for uh, lawyers after the fact. Uh, as I suggested then, the court might, following Northern Pipeline, try to restrict this to having prospective effect. There still could be some question about what exactly that means with respect to still pending cases or, or not totally final cases, et cetera. Um, one could imagine that the fix that Congress would put in place would be, could be relatively straightforward and simple. It might be simply allowing for the civil action uh, 
uh, in the district courts to challenge the result of inter partes review. And if private parties don't often choose to go that route, as opposed to taking a direct appeal to the federal circuit, uh, the practical forward implications might not be uh, so great, even though there would be immediate disruption. So as I said, it depends. I'll be very interested to see if we get any hints as to what the court is thinking when, when, when they have oral arguments whenever those occur. I don't think they've been scheduled yet. Thank you, John. That lays out, I think, the territory very nicely. And um, we'll move next to Mark Freeman. Uh, Artie, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm uh, counsel for the United States. Um, I'm not representing the government directly in the Supreme Court, uh, but uh, we, my colleague Will Haveman, who's in the back here, and I have handled these issues in the federal circuit in uh, the MCM versus HP case and in uh, the other cases that have raised the Article Three and Seventh Amendment questions. Um, it's, I hope you forgive me. It's necessary for me to state emphatically at the outset, I'm not here. I'm speaking on behalf of the federal government. I'm not here giving an official position in any regard. Uh, my, my former boss, Don really is down at the end of the line here. Um, as he will attest, uh, anything I, ca I say uh, uh, can well be overruled tomorrow by the Solicitor General of the United States, and uh, in which case the very next day I will be in court saying, yes, that and not what that moron said the day before. So. Um, uh, and particularly so in this case because the matter is before the, the Supreme Court of the United States. So I'm, I'm, I'm relatively circumscribed or, or limited in what I can say, and I, I apologize for that. But um, I, I think it would be useful uh, if we just take a step back. I mean, I remember when the AIA was enacted from the perspective of a litigator. Okay, it's my great privilege to represent the Patent and Trademark Office in the Courts of Appeals, um, along with lots of other federal agencies. Um, I think the the PTO has an incredibly difficult job. I think people don't, under, don't pause and appreciate their job is to figure out what is new and non-obvious in every field of human technological endeavor in the world. Uh, that's just an extraordinary task. Uh, and they do it, uh, I think, particularly given all of the constraints they operate under, they do it exceedingly well, uh, admirably, day after day. Um, when Congress enacted the AIA, uh, we all foresaw immediately that there would be a number of statutory and constitutional challenges. Um, we you know, sat down and looked at some of those. We expected litigation over the broadest reasonable interpretation. We expected litigation over the institution reviewability issues um, at issue in Wi-Fi One and, and Quozo. Uh, of course, there would be questions after the AIA about um, the new definition of prior art in Section 102. Um, all of those things. But we, I sort of, at least in my mind, identified a couple of, of uh, legal questions that I thought were going to be, like, I sort of described them as the n nuclear bomb questions. They were, they, were, they were very unlikely to go off, but if the bomb went off, it could be really bad. Um, uh, one of those uh, was the constitutional challenge under the uh, IP clause of the Constitution itself to the, to the change from a first to invent system to a first inventor to file system. Um, the, that suit was brought by Jonathan Massey. <laughs> <laughs> and he and I met one fateful day in the federal circuit. Um, uh, and uh, I won on standing, as the government likes to try to do. Um, uh, um, so that, qu that question, I think some, uh, in the last panel, someone mentioned that that issue petered out. It petered out because there wasn't a plaintiff with standing. No offense. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, may, that may come up someday. Um, another challenge that we identified, not immediately, but fairly early on as a potential big question was the issue many of you are familiar with in Ethicon versus Covidian about whether the director's delegation of the authority to institute to the Patent Trial and Appeal Board was a permissible exercise of executive uh, delegation authority, a uh, permissible act under the, uh, under the terms of the statute. That was a very interesting matter. We litigated that. Um, and then, of course, there's... The, what we now know is the oil states question. At the time, was the MCM versus HP question. Mm. Um, and speaking solely solely for myself, I have to say I didn't think that much of the issue. I thought, ah, that's creative. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, obviously, I was wrong that far because we're now here we are uh, in the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, so I. I uh, I think everything I have to say on the merits of the question is said in the government's brief in opposition in uh, oil states, also in our somewhat longer brief in opposition in the MCM versus HP case where cert was denied. Um, 
our brief on the merits is due on October 23rd, so stay tuned. <laughs> um, uh, we, but uh, I, can, I can say a couple things. Um, as a general matter, I mean, there's a lot of different frames for this case, but w one that I find intuitive is, again, in our, in our brief in opposition, is that the, putting aside the formalities, this is a, the, the IPR process is about a process that allows the Patent and Trademark Office to correct patentability mistakes that it made at the time that it granted a patent. Now, they may not have been mistakes in the sense that there was something in the record in front of the agency that they erroneously decided. In fact, most of the time, these are prior art of which the agency wasn't aware. And what, what the IPR process does is it harnesses the uh, incentives and knowledge of third parties who are affected by the patent grant to bring information to the PTO's attention so that it knows whether it made a mistake in the original grant. And that's why I find it ironic that some of the objections to the PTO process are framed in terms of the IPR process, are framed in terms of, well, why are we using BRI? I, I mean, of course, that issue is now resolved by a unanimous Supreme Court. But, but even aside from that, what we are doing in these cases is deciding you know, if, this, if the examiner had been aware of this prior art at the time that the application came to the office, like what would the answer have been? And what should the answer have been under the standard that the examiner would have applied at that time? You don't have a right to a patent just because you slip it by the examiner and they're not aware of the key prior art that shows it's not novel or it's not obvious. Um, as, people have, as people have observed, the, the right is conditioned upon satisfaction of those requirements in the Patent Act. So I, I think, you know, that's just a helpful way to think about what's going on here. Uh, and and I, I think informative of the Article 3 questions. Um, again, that, there'll be more on, on that and, and other points in our, in our merits brief. The other thing I'd say is that a lot of the arguments, including today, a lot of the observations talk, talk in terms of private property. And, I, you know, I, I often wonder to myself, and there's, this is in our brief as well, in what respect are those arguments different if what we are talking about is the government grant of cash? Okay, so let's just take my salary, all right? I'm a federal employee. If, 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 the, uh, if it's actually the Department of Agriculture for obscure reasons that manages my, my salary, I, I have no idea why, but <laughs> that's, where, that's where my check comes from. Um, if they inadvertently wire me $100 million on the next, you know, pay date, okay? Cash. That's property, right? I mean, going back to the, the repo man versus car thief, the, you know, if somebody came in and stole that $100 million, I mean, they would be a thief. Uh, but I tell you what, there is a federal statute that says if, an, if the government inad, inadvertently, mistakenly, it comes to attention, mistakenly at the time, give you money to which you are not entitled as a federal employee, they take it back. And so I wouldn't expect to be able to keep that money. Agencies... Congress has, for generations, given federal agencies the authority to correct the mistakes they made at the time they made them through administrative processes. Subject to judicial review, if it was my $100 million, I could go to court and say I get that back. I get de novo review of the legal questions in a court of law. But the, the, the authority of federal agencies to correct their mistakes is a fairly time-honored process. And in some respects, we think what's going on in the IPR process is, is exactly that. So I guess that's, that's all I should say uh, for now. And the other thing I'll say is, you know, whatever happens in this case, um, if, uh, if, if it goes, if IPR process goes down, um, there have been a lot of talk about the things. I, I know I will have a lot of work to do. <laughs> um, uh, and if the IPR process stays, I mean, I, I think, I guess all that happens is all patent owners assign their patents to Indian tribes. <laughs> 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 at, least, at least I read that in the paper. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all patent lawyers become constitutional lawyers, it seems. <laughs> yeah, Jonathan, next. Well, um, Jonathan Massey, I uh, filed a brief, a petition, uh, an amicus brief supporting the petitioners in this case on behalf of the Biotech Industry Association and the Association of University Technology Managers. I'd just like to go on record as saying, Mark, if you get overpaid, I will represent you. <laughs> <laughs> and Thank our you. theory will be that it is a vested right that cannot be taken away. <laughs> so, uh, no. So, uh, the topic of this panel is the implications of oil states for the administrative state, which I think is a brilliant idea because the whole Article Three jurisprudence 
is, is really underdeveloped in the Supreme Court. And there are multiple conflicting strands of jurisprudence which come into play. And it's, it's uh, just, the, you know, you're all undoubtedly familiar, sort of the, 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 old, the old chestnut was a case called Kroll v. Benson in 1932 that, said, that upheld a system of administrative compensation for maritime workers' comp. And it said that Congress uh, or the legislature could could create a system that took what heretofore were common law claims and have them be adjudicated through an administrative system. And that was kind of a damages computation scheme because it was a no-fault workers' comp scheme. And it was kind of a very relatively small uh, but important step for the court to say that, it, that a damages computation question, which seemed relatively ministerial, could be done through an administrative scheme rather than a judicial one. And that case kind of chugged along and created precedent. And then in the, in the 80s, the Supreme Court really started grappling again with, with these questions, and they permeated several, several <laughs> different areas. One, one we've heard, you know, we, we were, I'm not going to go through the cases, but you all know the, the, the Thomas against Union Carbide, a case in front about a compensation scheme among pesticide manufacturers under FIFRA, the Federal Act for for getting pesticide approval, the CFTC v. Shore case, which involved a state law counterclaim uh, that someone would raise if, the C if, a, uh, if, if someone brought a CFTC complaint against a broker, the Northern Pipeline case. And the, the, just to summarize, the court was all over the place in not particularly predictable ideological fashion. In other words, uh, so Justices, uh, Justice Scalia was kind of on his own saying, I believe that when administrative agencies exercise uh, Article I authority, they're not exercising the judicial power of the United States. And he had other theories for unitary executive theories and other ideas for why administrative agencies might be um, might be might have to, might need to be cut back and should be restricted. But Article Three wasn't part of, wasn't a big part of his thinking. Justices White and O'Connor had a very pragmatic approach to giving agencies authority, and those were the opinions in Shore and in Thomas. And they had this functional list of questions and factors. Uh, the kind of multi-factor balancing test that Justice Scalia hated, but that was their approach. And it was really the liberals, led by Brennan, mm -hmm. who said there should be a sharp limit to the authority of Congress to assign Article Three authority to administrative agencies. And Brennan had a, grand, a case called Grand Financiera later, which imported the Seventh Amendment into this, which was an additional layer of complication. And, and then that sort of has, has chugged along, and the court in recent decades has used this in bankruptcy cases, uh, really, to establish that there are limits on bankruptcy judges and the need for consent for mat federal magistrates to exercise certain powers. And, and it's not been a particularly um, smooth ride. And on top of this, there is a series of, a lot of the conservative justices on the current court have serious serious questions, reservations about agency authority, mostly because of Chevron and associated doctrines, which seem to cede a lot of law, you know, law articulating power to agencies. And so the chief, even Justice Kennedy, uh, certainly Justice Alito, all have reservations about the growth of agency power. So it, you know, this, while this issue came up and uh, has, has, uh, while the oil states issue has come up several times in MCM and other cases and had been denied repeatedly by the Supreme Court, after Justice Gorsuch got on the court, the court granted. And so a lot of people in the bar think, you know, is this a coincidence? Maybe not such a coincidence. And it's interesting because, of course, Justice Gorsuch is a fierce critic of Chevron. Uh, you know, he went to the extent, when he was on the Tenth Circuit, he went to the uh, to the extent of writing a majority opinion that relied on Chevron and then writing a separate opinion saying Chevron's Chevron's a bad doctrine. <laughs> so you don't do that. You don't write separately as, when you're writing the majority unless you have strong views. So is, it, could it be that people who don't like Chevron also don't like Congress's power to assign adjudicatory authority to agencies because they think it makes agencies too powerful? It's hard to say. But I think that the, the, what this case means for the administrative state is, is significant because um, Congress... Uh, Congress has obviously uh, created a, 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 I mean, the patent system has chugged along since the 19th century in a kind of separate parallel track to the growth of the administrative state. And this will be the court's opportunity, really, uh, to, to, to deal with that intersection. 
And, and I think that the, the kinds of schemes that the court has looked at under our Article 3, like the scheme in Shore, the scheme in, in Thomas against Union Carbide, the scheme in Kroll v. Benson, are all different, really, from this kind of scheme, the IPR scheme, because those were really ancillary to federal, uh, to, they were very limited schemes that were ancillary to other uh, federal programs that involved not rights that were sort of enumerated in the Constitution or, or had deep historical roots. They involved schemes that, were, that had uh, different adjudicatory procedures that didn't seek to imitate courts. They didn't have, um, they, they had, a, 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 the court in every instance addressed the fairness and the impartial nature of the decision maker. Here, the uh, PTAB judges are, are, are Title V uh, appointees by the Department of Commerce that pursue uh, that pursue a particular agenda. So anyway, those, uh, those are all really uh, interesting questions that the court's going to grapple with. And I think, um, Artie, you're to be applauded for recognizing the, the intersection here of, of Article III and, and IP law in a way that, um, that will shed, illuminate uh, both, both areas of law. Well, thank you, Jonathan. Um, I have written on these issues, as have many of the people on this panel. So I'll have I'll just highlight two points that um, I'd love people's responses to. The first is it is a very interesting origin story, if you will, with Justice Brennan really being the creator of these formalist distinctions. And that's sort of an interesting right. piece of the puzzle. And I wonder if anyone would want to comment on that question. Um, uh, the other point that I think is interesting is you mentioned Chevron. Um, and one of the pieces of this puzzle that John Golden and I have actually debated in the literature is the fact that, as it happens, these adjudicatory procedures, the results of which um, might be seen as Chevron-worthy, um, the Justice Department and the PTO have not sought Chevron. Um, so it's sort of... Uh, it may be, again, patent-specific administrative law, or it may be, as John Golden has said, that they don't deserve Chevron. But on legal issues, the Federal Circuit does review these adjudicatory results de novo. Right. I, well, I don't think, I wasn't using Chevron in that way. Right, what I mean right. is there's this strand of, a broader strand on the court uh, that is suspicious of Chevron oh, because yeah. they worry that agencies have too much power. And that strand of, of concern, I think, intersects IP law here because I think the, one of their issues is agencies, if agencies are too powerful, then, uh, th th then that same concern comes here, not because of the Chevron deference point, but just because the PTAB is doing stuff that they, the court doesn't think it should be doing. Right. It's just a general concern. I think we're seeing on the Supreme Court a, a more concern about the growth of the administrative state than, the, uh, than a lot of people expected. Great. Um, Erica, you wanted to chime in? Um, so just one um, sort of something we encountered in one of our PTAB cases that I think uh, kind of goes to this point of Chevron deference or deference to the agency decisions. And maybe one of the things that the board chose to do in its rulemaking process that um, made things maybe worse than they need to be. And that is um, on the motions to amend practice, which is one of the areas that's gotten a lot of press and a lot of concern by uh, patent owners in particular, and now as an en banc case at the Federal Circuit. The agency decided um, affirmatively, according to the agency, that they were not going to do a notice and comment rulemaking, that instead they were going to do adjudicatory rulemaking, and so they didn't actually issue rules on how to amend your claims in these, in these proceedings. And so what we ran into representing patent owners who had trouble with the, who weren't allowed to amend their claims, when we got to the federal circuit and really dug into the, the standard of review that the agency was seeking there, it wasn't even Chevron deference, I guess, when you're reviewing um, an agency's own interpretation of its own regulations. So you're adding another layer of, of even more deference. And so I think our deference, our the way deference. That was exactly. all of you right. know much yeah. more about than I do. Right. Right. But from the practitioner's standpoint, and motions to amend being one of the really hot button issues that uh, bubbled up as part of the PTAB, I think the agency's choice to use 
adjudicatory rulemaking, I don't know if it was intentional mm. to give themselves even more deference, but it really, I think, led to even more problems for the agency and kind of an interesting mm. collision with, I mean, they're not even looking for regular, but even more. So it made the motions to amend that much worse. So I just, I point that out as some, you know, something we sort of experienced, didn't really realize it when we heard the adjudicatory rulemaking, oh, okay, we'll have decisions and that'll explain it. But then when you actually look at what that means, once you get on review to the Article Three court, it became mm -hmm. quite different. Great. Um, John Duffy. Thank you, Artie, and thanks for inviting me. This is very exciting to me as an ad law teacher. <laughs> Extremely exciting. Because every year when I teach Article Three in the administrative state, I start out with telling my students one poll star data point, which is that there is no administrative adjudicatory system that has ever been declared unconstitutional, right? That's something you can take to the bank. <laughs> and I'll say, and that's actually why we've got to look at some bankruptcy cases and everybody groans. <laughs> They're like, oh, you know, administrative law is boring enough, but bankruptcy too? <laughs> um, and I say, I apologize for that, but we have no cases on the other side of the line. And therefore, to give you some sense of where the line might be, we'll look at some of these bankruptcy cases because perhaps that tells us something about Article 3 and we have to study Article 3 a little bit. Now, as much as an ad law teacher, I'd love to see another case on the other side of the line. Every case that, that Jonathan Massey just mentioned, <laughs> Rolvey Benson, Thomas versus Union Carbide, Shore, all the big cases, I teach all those cases. And who wins in that case? Right, exactly. Every time the agency wins in that case. So I'd love to have another case. It would make my job, my primary job, easier. More. But I'm here to tell you that um, this case is the absolute worst place you could possibly imagine finding the case on the other side of the line. <laughs> that of all administrative areas, the one area that the Supreme Court is for the first time in its entire history going to find that administrative adjudication doesn't work is in the patent system where we've had administrative adjudication. Indeed, it's been dominated by ad administrative adjudication for the entire history of the country. And indeed, I'll say something else, and this is important to understand just how backwards and I think upside down this whole case is. For the fa past 150 years, there has been a tremendous shift of power from the courts to the executive branch in this agency. Somebody on the earlier panel said, oh, this is a tremendous shift away from the courts. That's already been happening with something called the presumption of validity. The presumption of validity tells the uh, courts that they cannot overturn the executive branch decision, even if it's completely unreasoned, unless there's clear and convincing evidence that it was wrong. This is radical in all administrative law, in every other facet of administrative law. If you can prove that the agency failed to engage in what's called reasoned decision making, that's quote, directly quote from Supreme Court opinions by Justice Scalia and Justice Kagan, bipartisan support for that view, codified in the Administrative Procedure Act. Um, if, you, if the agency is not engaged in that, then the agency's um, uh, decision must be vacated. And then it gets remanded to the agency to, to see if they can come up with some better reasoning. That does not, according to federal circuit precedent, and actually the Supreme Court's never decided this, that can't happen in the, in the, with the patent grant. The agency's decision, no matter how unreasoned, has to be respected by the courts. And that's quite a radical accumulation of executive power that did not exist in the, at the time of the framing. At the time of the framing, and I just read the statutes from, eight, from 1790, 1793, it said, at most, the uh, grant of the patent was prima facie evidence, which is not a presumption, just means that if, if, you, if there are no ev other evidence, that would prove your case, that you were the original and true inventor. But the, but the plaintiff, pardon me, the defendant got to plead the general issue. In other words, there was no presumption. There was no presumption. At most, you know, maybe the defendant had the burden of proof. I'm, I'm not even sure the defendant did have the burden of proof on that. But nonetheless, that was what happened then. So in that case, if you asked, if, is there a jury trial right? You know, you could fight one way or the other about that, but we are miles away from that system. We are having uh, a, an extreme constraint on the jury function and the court's function already. And the question now is, what does this new statute do? What does the IPR process do? And the IPR process puts patents really back into the mainstream and is a constraint 
on executive power. It's a constraint because for the section of patents that are subjected to IPR, the courts will ultimately get to decide whether the agency engaged in reasoned decision making for the first time. That is actually the norm elsewhere, and that's an accumulation of power to the, to the judicial branch. And I think that um, in some ways you can think about this. I mean, people talk about is our patents property or not. What's really going on in this case is that the presumption of validity, which exists after the grant of the patent, is being flipped to a presumption of invalidity. And that certainly is not a property right. You might have a pro even if you could say, and prove to me nine ways to Sunday that patents are property, I would say surely the presumption of validity, which grows out of an administrative concept of deference to the agency, that is not a traditional form of property. And all that happens is that if your patent gets ruled, if the agency rules against your patent, well then you have to go to court to prove that they're wrong. But the patent actually is not vacated until the court acts, until the court acts, if you, and you have a right to judicial review. So all we're doing is replacing the, the presumption of validity with a presumption of invalidity. And that surely is something that is, is, is not something that's a traditional form of property. I'll just say one last word about the right of judi the uh, jury trial right. That, again, is completely upside down. The Supreme Court has repeatedly said that there's no right to juries in review of an administrative agency action. And indeed, for the plaintiffs and the petitioners, the topside people, um, it is true they want to draw an analogy between this and mining claims and other things like that. And in that area, the Supreme Court ruled that you could not, you could not use a jury to overturn the agency action. You had to use an equitable action with a judge sitting. So the idea that there's a jury trial right to overturn an administrative determination is, I just think, radically upside down and actually cuts against numerous Supreme Court doctrines. So that's my view. I come out on one side in this case, I think, um, intellectually. But I think it's as much as I'd love to see another case, this is clearly not the case to be on the other side of the constitutionality of administrative adjudication. Great. Thank you, John. Um, are there any responses immediately to John's clever argument? I, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> well, John waded into my, my bailiwick, which is the history, and that's because you won't find the presumption of validity in the statute, which is why John finds it so odd, because the presumption of validity, as I showed in my 2007 article, Who Cares What Thomas Jefferson Thought About Patents, in reference to Judge Smith's earlier reference, that it was actually created by the courts um, in the early 19th century by analogy to title deeds and land. They said that when there are ambiguities and questions about, about how you interpret a title deed in land, and as for anyone who teaches property law knows, there's tons of litigation about what's the meaning of terms in title deeds. They said that the, the, that the interpretive presumption is in favor of the property owner, and the court's expl Supreme Court explicitly said, patents are title deeds, we are adopting this interpretive canon from the common law and interpretation of title deeds of land long before the 1836 uh, examination process. So the original justification for a presumption of validity in favor of patents had nothing to do with examination. It had to do with that these were actually uh, analogized, and more than analogized, they were conceptually and doctrinally linked to title deeds of land. And the codification of this presumption in the 1952 Patent Act is just a codification of the judicially created presumption, which after 1836 comes to be also buttressed by the by the point that you also give deference to an to agency review of the patent application itself. So you ended up with, in the 19th century, two justifications for the presumption. Um, the one comes to dominate our conception, particularly in the modern age, as we adopt a more administrative approach, which John has to, uh, to patents. John gets a quick Re point. Sir, to sir reply? Yeah. <laughs> more than a, for more than 150 years, there has been this shift. I think that the presumption of validity might have had some early antecedents, and it certainly was created over the course of the 19th century, and it was created in the courts before it was codified. Um, but I don't really think that that changes, that if we, if we take a historical test and we go back to the time of the framing, um, whether, you know, basic issues that, that, that are in the IPR system, which is not the construction of the patent in terms of, you know, exactly where do the claims end, but really questions of if, if there's a piece of prior art that was totally missed, that was the general issue that was adjudicated de novo in the, in the, in the pre-1836 Act. Now, even that got a presumption of validity that the courts created out of whole cloth, I think, in, in the later 19th century and in the 20th century and then codified in the 1952 Act. 
But that's where we're all, and this, this basically, if that is, if it's constitutional to do that, if it's constitutional to give the executive that much power um, to, 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 to um, have a presumption of validity on these things, I think it's completely constitutional for the executive to come back and say, well, for that, we're going to flip that to a presumption of invalidity because we've taken a second look at it, and we no longer believe it. And if you, if you can prove us wrong in the courts, that's fine. But the burden's going to be on you, and it's going to be a weighty burden, just like the presumption of validity is a weighty burden. Okay, Greg, and then we'll have to move on. Just to add to my uh, point about, uh, just to add to my point about so much getting thrown in to these to add to my point about so much getting thrown into these issues that have nothing to do with like Article Three, uh, the in Northern Pipeline, the plurality, this one of the strongest opinions against administrative or not administrative adjudication, non Article Three adjudication, the court specifically says, well, clearly if Congress creates the right, they can assign burdens of proof. So that uh, the court, I mean, the, these the burden of proof issue just really doesn't have anything to do with Article Three issues. Okay, um, Melissa. Okay, so uh, thank you, Ari, very much um, for inviting me here today. So I wanted to talk, uh, obviously, about the implications of this case to the administrative state. Um, and as others have said on this panel, the Supreme Court jurisprudence on when you adjudicate in a non-Article III um, court not is not a picture of clarity. And so um, in order to sort of understand the implications, obviously, it's going to depend on you know, how the Supreme Court comes out, but it's also the analytical approach, I think, that it takes. So there's sort of two strains that Jonathan, I think, talked about was a more formalistic approach in the bankruptcy context where they've held things unconstitutional um, to adjudicate state claims. And then a line of cases where Shore, Union Carbide, and Wellness, right, where they've taken a more pragmatic, functional approach, and then their analysis have really sort of asked, is this an encroachment on the federal judiciary? Are there sort of separation of power concerns through this multi-factor test um, if we removed this from Article Three and put it in um, an agency tribunal um, or an, an Article One court? Um, and so... To really sort of understand or to think about it, I'm sort of playing with this idea of what if they do find it unconstitutional? What other boards or adjudicatory agencies um, may also be in peril, right? Um, so if they take a very formalistic approach, which um, it's the history, it's the uniqueness, right, historical of patent law, then, yeah, I think it's a more limited um, view. I think, you know, that cuts back, or that's a hard road, I think, to find in part because I think some of the other justices, like, Justice Thomas has sort of hinted, at least in trademarks, for example, right, that these are quasi-property rights that clearly can be adjudicated in these non-Article III forums. Um, but if they took a more, that pragmatic line of coach, uh, cases and found it unconstitutional, um, which I think just reading those cases, it should come out that it's constitutional, but if, if they went the other way, I just want to think about like what would happen to other agency adjudications of private disputes, in particular in the IP system. So most obviously, the TTAB, right, the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board. Would we have any concern that that would be unconstitutional? And so I think even if PTAB falls, which is unlikely, there are other sort of reasons that the TTAB would still hold up to be um, constitutional, arguably, right? So one, with the trademark rights, right? Um, remember, trademark rights obviously come from use, right? They're state common law. And the trademark registration system, right, uh, came about with, with the Lanham Act. Um, and created these sort of extra registration rights. So you could have argued that this is more closely tied to the implementation of the regulatory structure. It doesn't have the unique sort of history on the trademark registration side as, as patent rights. But also one of the factors that the court takes into account in this pragmatic multi-factor test is the plenary power the courts still have over adjudication, right, um, in, the, in the agency, which is why John thought one of the fixes here were just to do a trial de novo associated with PTAB. And one of the interesting things, I think, in TTAB, when they have this inter-party cancellation, right, of, of trademark registration rights, um, that you can either appeal both to the federal circuit or get a trial de novo um, in the district court. So I think both of those things would sort of shield that more from the constitutional challenge. I think the other interesting um, one to think about is the Copyright Royalty Board, 
right, which also adjudicates, it sets rates and terms and distributes royalties payable under government established licensing schemes, right? And it's also private disputes between um, individuals. And there, you know, they don't have a trial de novo sort of appeal, like a do-over, which if your concern is taking power away from the Article 3, as long as you give your adjudicate, uh, agency adjudication a sort of do-over in an Article 3 court, that is not as pressing. Um, you can only, there, their decisions are reviewed to determine if they're arbitrary, capricious, abuse of discretion, or otherwise not in accordance in the law. But I think you can make arguments that that's more tightly wound to the sort of or nor, more narrow sort of limited jurisdiction that may not give rise to as many Article III uh, concerns because although they make really significant and, and million dollar sometimes disputes, right, with the rates that they set, they are determining the various statutory licensees under that are clearly sort of enumerated um, in, the, in the Copyright Act. Um, so that's all you know, that I wanted to say today. So, Melissa, you're saying that basically in both those cases you think they could be distinguished. Yeah, and I think, like, the one thing I w would say, the one in the IP regime that would have been the most concerning that uh -huh. never got created but there was a lot of talk about was the copyright small claims court, mm -hmm. right? Because in that sense, that mimics more of PTAB and you have these broader rights, right, that you can bring in and damages and any sort of things that you would argue more is usurping Article Three power. Although, wasn't that supposed to be entirely... By, voluntary? By, by consent. Okay. Yes, that, no, that's what I was just going to say. Yeah. yeah, and so the way that they had sort of largely fixed that, right, was just to say it's voluntary. And if you can, under wellness, Right, where, where the Supreme Court suggests <laughs> consent can cure all in the bankruptcy, well, you know, state course, claim. Of course, there was a vigorous dissent by Justice Roberts in that yes. case. So, yes. um, so, you know, consent is an interesting question, I think, in the context of Article 3, um, which I'd love to get other people's opinions on at some point, although we don't have to address that right now. But are there any tribunals that you think, if, if the court takes a functional approach, yeah. um, that would fall? In addition to the... I to don't... The I mean, I haven't... I've been looking outside of this, right? Uh -huh. Other tribunals that are doing private disputes, right, in the ag agricultural area and some other. Mm -hmm. And I haven't necessarily found one that I think is on these sort of realms of arguing it's not more tightly bound or the sort of more plenary trial de novo review. Interesting. Anyone else think that if they did take a functional approach, anything else would fall? I think it's all fine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Josh. Maybe Josh has some ideas on what would fall. Uh, on that and then on another topic. So on what would fall, unless one is going to distinguish between exclusive rights and use rights, you can think of uh, drug approval licensing as property rights that could fall on a formalist ground. Similarly, Tosk and FIFRA approvals. That means that Congress would have to legislate claims for the government to go to court in theory to invalidate drug approvals, which seems to me a really bad idea. Um, on the dispute between John and Adam, there's actually a tie back to what Mark was saying that I wanted to point out, and that is the characterization of this as either a deed or as a invalidation proceeding makes a, or mistake correction is really important. So if you think of this as a sign or estoppel, and the government shouldn't be assigning to one person and then pulling it back, right? Um, there's still the property if it's land, there's still the property if it's cash. If it's a patent, it goes away. There's no property at all. And that, I think, makes a huge difference to how you view this, and we'll see if the court does. Great. Uh, John, did you want to respond to that? or? Um. No, no, I think we should, we should okay. carry on. All right. Further discussion. Carry on. Yeah. Okay, John Thorne. So is this fun or what? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, by my count, according to SCOTUS blog, uh, before I left to come over here, there are now 30 amicus briefs filed. Um, there is even an amicus brief by something I'd never heard of before called the Council of Amicus Brief Writers. <laughs> <laughs> And it says it's in support of neither party, but in fact, it, supported, it supports the petition because it generates so much business for amicus brief <laughs> writers. Um, if you're looking for a, a field guide to the, some of the better amicus briefs, I, I want to call out one in particular because um, the author's not in the room and he's not represented, so I can, I can talk about him without, uh, without embarrassing anybody. But uh, Josh Siegel at Jenner and Block wrote a brief for the PTAB Bar Association. 
which is I, I think I think it's just it's terrifically well done. There's also a good brief by Pharma um, for Pharma by Jeff Lampkin, but the Josh Siegel brief makes in particular a, a point about the the trade-off between the initial grant and 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 the ability to correct an improper grant, and and this is an area where where the ability to correct is is just hugely important. Um, I think we're now up to something north of 650,000 applications per year at the Patent Office. Uh, the Patent Office staff has not grown commensurate with the, the burden imposed. Technologies change, making it, frankly, much harder to understand when, when a, a technology is, is really novel or, or something that all the software engineers believe is, is, is obvious. Um, the laws change. You've got uh, the Supreme Court's decision in Alice and Nautilus. Uh, uh, anyway, the, the changes in the law, the development of technology, the sheer volume of what the patent office has to deal with leads to uh, just, it's inevitable to make a few mistakes. Um, IPRs have been used for good. I like, I like as one example, uh, there, there was a, a case filed in the Eastern District of Texas, Texas against uh, 15 or 16 broadcasters over a, or a concept that most people in the audience will not be familiar with, and that's where you take a, a single story told by audio and you break it up into, into serial components and you, you cast or podcast them into separate union, units. Um, I've, I've learned that there was something called the Lone Ranger where this, this guy on a horse uh, had a story, it was told on radio, but it's broken up into segments. And it's not a new idea, the PTAB crushed it. Um, that's exactly what ought to be done in, in correcting the agency's action. That's, that's, that's the patent piece. Of, of what's at stake. Good news for the for the pharma folks is the pharma patents are much less challenged and much more often upheld. And of course, you've got Article Three review afterward. But um, something that seems to be working, uh, being challenged, is that that's that's the patent concern. But the Constitution specifically gives Congress the right to set up a patent system. Congress made findings that the system set up had allowed a lot of bad patents out of, the, out of the barn and they needed to be corralled and brought back in. Um, Congress set up this system. It, 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 if, if Congress can't do this, if con Congress can't assign additional, uh, an additional Bureau of Corrections to uh, um, fix some of these problems, then you've got to change it at the other end. Um, back when one of my friends was uh, 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 in, in grad school, I, I, think this is, I think I've got the sequence right, Justice Breyer was his professor, then Professor Breyer. Um, supervised a paper called uh, Gatekeepers versus Exorcists, the, the administrative law choice of do you let, do you let things loose and, and with what standards of, of care and letting them loose and, and are you able after the fact to exercise the ones that shouldn't have gotten loose. It, it's a general administrative law problem. So I actually think, I think this is a, a good case as a general administrative law question and it, it, it's mostly not about patents. The, the geniuses that uh, some in the back of the room that, that got cert granted, that's a hard thing to do, um, approach this not, not from the point of view of, of uh, are the patent judges uniquely bad in some way, but is, is all administrative law bad? Um, Philip Hamburger, one of the, one of the very bright um, administrative and, and constitutional scholars that's thought about this problem for many, many years, um, writes about patents in his, you see this in the webcast, his, his book is Administrative Law Unlawful. That's just one of a bunch of books. Um, he writes about the patent system, saying that uh, the problem with patents, he's almost like Jefferson, the problem with patents is if you don't confine them to things that are truly new and important, you've, imp you've impinged on somebody else's right. So he says that assigning to the patent office the function of granting duplicative patents, somebody else already got a patent that they're operating under, or, or a, a technology is obvious and it belongs to the public, assigning a patent that, that reads on somebody else's previously patented business or something that is in the public domain, he says that's unconstitutional. The, 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 the worry about the administrative state is not about canceling patents. Uh, as as, as I, I read Philip Hamburger, it's about, it's about patents that, that interfere with other people's existing rights described in prior publications or patents or, or things that belong to the public because they're obvious. So it, I think it's a, this is, it's a great case to be involved in. You've got uh, uh, a good panel already for putting this together, and I thought I had one other thing I wanted to say quickly. Oh, taxi licenses. Um, I, what, a, what, a great, what a great label for, for this, because uh, um, think how taxi licenses are, 
are impeding the, the free flow of the economy, which is going to move beyond taxi licenses. Anyway, th thanks, for, thanks for inviting me here. So, um, John Thorne, you raise a question that I think John Duffy would like to speak to as well, which is, is the real problem that Congress has not set up some way to challenge the patent before it's granted, because there is no really when robust. When it is system. granted, let's say, or before, um, so so, or or when it is granted. So, so I, I think that's exactly yeah. right. That if you're worried about executive power, you should be concerned not about this case. You should be concerned about the grant. And then there's no Supreme Court precedent, but there's Federal Circuit precedent that says there's no APA review. And let me just describe an alternative system here. Imagine if the grant of patents is a public rights function, and that can constitutionally be assigned to the executive. I don't think no one's challenging that. No one's is, saying is that, that, that right. Is no one is anyone saying everybody that thinks pre -grant the executive can grant patents, right? And pre-grant, okay. they can determine in any way, shape, or form how to do it. So, so let's say that that's is, is anyone disagreeing with that? Adam's nodding, and if Adam's nodding, it's got to be that no one does. <laughs> well, when you so that's my public, acid test. It's right? a public you say any way, shape, <laughs> or form. Yeah, I think that's any way. Well, let's just say okay. let's just say the tr the way they're doing it now. Okay. And let me add one more thing. Let's say that the federal circuit is is wrong that there is APA review, or that the Congress legislatively overrules federal circuit precedent and says. The patent office grants are agency action, and they're subject to traditional APA review, just like every other agency. OK, now the patent office gets sued. And I know, Mark, you don't like this. Yeah. The patent <laughs> office gets sued. I got to do something. Um, and yeah, that's right. You'll get more money from the Department of Agriculture. Right. The, uh, <laughs> the, the, Department of, uh, the agency gets sued, and they sit in a room. Let's say there's just three of them. They sit in a room, and they read over the briefs. And they say, no, by golly, it's more likely than not that one of these claims is going to be invalidated based on this, the, the filings. So we're going to seek a voluntary remand, which under lower court precedent and, federal, and Supreme Court precedent is something that you give to an agency if they request it. And that if, if, you know, those are just three steps. Grant the patent, APA review, then seek a voluntary remand when it meets the standard that's actually set forth in the statute here, which is it's more likely than not, or it's, you know, there's a substantial chance that the, one of the claims is going to be invalidated by the reviewing court. Then you get back to the agency, and then all you have to do is say, it's okay for other people at this point to come in and, 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 and send their arguments. If you think about it in those four steps, and, and this is a formalist way of thinking about it. I know people are saying, oh, if the court's functionalist, it should, it should uphold this. But formalist, maybe not. I'm a formalist. And I think this is utterly a backward suit, because I think those four steps are completely consistent. They're consistent with the traditions of the administrative state, they're consistent with separation of powers, each and every one of them. And what you do is you wind up with a, exactly what you have now. Um, and I think there's no, there's, well, that's, that's I think the alternative. And I think that would be an alternative to, to this. If it, if it did it crazily get held unconstitutional, Congress should grant APA review. And then the agency just seeks a voluntary remand back to the agency and it then starts doing the adjudication with, with third parties involved. John, you wanted to say yeah, something? Yeah, I just want to short ball, and just because, of course, we have to have all the Johns. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, um, so um, I just think, you know, when you look at, uh, say, Thomas's dissent in wellness, when he gives his, sort of, he says, historically, public rights were understood as rights belonging to the people at large. I think, kind of consistent with these comments, you can think, well, the public right, at least one set of public rights that might be understood to be an issue at I IPRs are the public rights of the general citizenry of the United States to use their uh, property in ways that aren't encumbered by invalidly issued patent rights. Uh, and I, I think that's kind of consistent with the, the, the statements that are, are being suggested here about um, how patents um, can actually, the issuance of patents uh, can actually be in position on the public, uh, which uh, uh, otherwise, we, we don't necessarily have an ability to challenge unless you're, you're threatened with suit. Well, can I, I mean, yeah. the public rights is an interesting category. I mean, that is sort of where history comes in on the Article Three component. And of course, the, the public court's categorization is sort of slapdash, but we know things like customs duties, taxes, membership in Indian tribes, things like that are public rights disputes. And it, it seems a little odd to throw patents into that category because they do have the whole, as Adam points out, you know, the whole uh, analogy to land and traditional forms of property in a way that really 
does seem to quite different from the way the court has treated, you know, customs duties. Well, how did they get granted in the first place then? Well, I, I mean, I think that the, the notion of patent rights is, is uh, the Constitutional Clause says secure. So I think I think the framers I think the evidence is, is pretty clear that that, that the framers and, and, and this is sort of um, story and Marshall and, and so on that that the 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 patent right was cr is an inchoate right when it's in the sort of the mind of the inventor it's the sweat and ingenuity of the inventor that is the ultimate foundation and then the the, the role of the government is to secure the right by perfecting it but it, it's it's not the executive branch adjudicates that. right but I, I think. Yes, except I think it was quite clear that the, the one thing the patent clause was meant to do was to get away from the system of royal prerogatives that the, that the British crown had and that European systems had. So the, the, I, don't, I think the Constitution is, is sort of a, a, a clear repudiation of the sort of positive, positive view that patents have a right, have an existence only insofar as the government say they are, says they do. Because otherwise, there could never be a takings claim against the government. We know that when Congress abrogates patents, there is a takings claim. Or at least the court has said that that would be a constitutionally relevant, uh, constitutionally questionable. You don't, need, you don't need to go to that point, though, to answer John's question, because the fact of the matter is, every property right in land in this country starts with a patent grant. That's true. And there's conditions imposed upon that patent grant, and that patent is issued, they're called land patents. And, they're, and that patent is, condi is issued on conditions. You've done, you've, for, you were the first possessor, you were the discoverer of it. This is Johnson v. McIntosh, the great case that we all uh, studied in our first uh, property class that I teach here every year. And, um, and that's issued by the executive agencies. So I, I, the, some of these arguments are just a little too neat and pat that don't actually match on to actually our, our constitutional practice, either with respect to property rights tangibly or property rights intangibly. So Adam, why don't you go next? <laughs> so you know, I, I, it's interesting. I've been I, my my bailiwick is history and constitutional issues and, and patents as private property rights. But um, uh, I'm actually here to uh, to uh, to speak more generally about the the, the PTAB as an administrative agency, um, or um, and how um, it is. I think possible for the Supreme Court to. Um, I don't think it can dodge the private versus public because that's kind of a primary predicate question to get to get that's the ante room question because if it's a public right, then you can do anything you want with it. So if you're if they're going to the, to find some type of uh, constitutional protection for it, they have to as a predicate matter I think find it private. Um, they could mess with the categories and say it's quasi private, which is what Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas did in in in, a, in, in opinion with respect to the TTAB, and then say maybe validity is public and the rest of it's private or something of that sort. But they have to, I think, address that issue in some way. But I don't think that striking down the PTAB necessarily will wreak havoc throughout the rest of the administrative state. Um, I find it very revealing that Melissa, you, you had some trouble finding some cases because the PTAB really is very unique, right? It's you'll you'll have trouble finding with throughout the administrative state this a an, an adversarial process where th any third party, anyone in the world, can file a petition, and it's an a, and, it and, it, and it sets forth a process where there is an adversarial hearing um, that involves the cancellation of a vested property right, um, and it's and it's a full adjudicatory type hearing. Um, and so, you know, it's very different from what came before, and I know there's been allusions to review, but the reviews of patents under prior systems, even the ex parte review and inter partes review that, um, that existed before um, the AIA, you know, were not uh, full adversarial adjudicatory processes that were dedicated to the cancellation of the patent right as such. Um, and, and that was not how they were viewed and that was not how they were structured. And I think this is one of the reasons why the PTAB was, has, has presented such a huge issue to the uh, various stakeholders in the innovation industries. Um, and I believe you know, that what happened is, is that you have the classic nirvana fallacy from the AIA where they said, look, we have some, a few bad actors in the system, we have a few bad patents that are clogging the gears of the innovation economy, we should get rid of them, so we're going to create an agency. And by the way, we're not going to impose any limits on them. The point of the agency is to cancel patent rights. Go to it. And without any structural, procedural, or substantive limits imposed upon this agency, I'm shocked, shocked to discover an agency has started to run amok a bit um, and, has, and, and, is, and is classified as a death squad for patents. Um, something that Judge Smith, you said, if we weren't doing some death squatting, we wouldn't be doing our job under the AIA. I mean, um, I mean so, um, and when we, and in a recent, um, 
in a recent uh, uh, discussion with some admin law experts and some patent law experts that that uh, that Artie was at and Melissa was at and a couple others, we you know we we you know we were we were kicking around like getting our heads around what is the PTAB, right? With you know trying to place it within the administrative law and administrative state, and 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 eventually I was like. You know, I love that 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 Hans earlier said, "If it quacks like a duck," raising the duck metaphor. Because you know, I said the PTAB's a platypus, right? It kind of, it's it's unique unto itself. It's not really a duck. It's not really a beaver. It's 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 a really unique type of agency <laughs> that was created by the AIA. Um, and um, and so a lot of what you see as the procedural and substantive problems that have been inherent in the PTAB and that patent owners have been, I think, legitimately complaining about now for several years. Um, are presented by the PTAB, and the, and the problem is structural, right? Um, you have you know, the stacking of panels by the director of the patent office. Um, after a panel comes with a decision, the director of the patent office says, I don't like that decision. You held the patent to be valid. I'm going to add two more judges to their panel. They came out with the decision again, saying, no, the patent is valid. And the director again said, I don't like that decision. I'm going to add two more judges to the panel because you didn't reach the right decision. <laughs> and then on seven judges, they now found the patent to be invalid, and the director said, OK, I accept it. Right? I mean, could you f I, we, have, we, have, we have packing of judicial panels. And no, and no one is batting an eye at this, except recently the Federal Circuit, when it was brought to their attention. And they were very shocked to hear this, um, especially given that it is relates. it's not even ex-ante packing. This is not FDR's core packing plan. Mm -hmm. plan. <laughs> this is actually packing after a decision came down, and they were unhappy with the actual decision. And they're actually working to reverse it, right? Um, you have uh, you know, de facto denial of the right of amendment of the patent, which is provided explicitly in the AIA. And the PTAB has used the 12 month, the 12 month time limit right to justify denying virtually every single request to amend the right to the right to amend um, you know you have serial filings of, of these petitions um, uh, many times for purposes having nothing to do with the validity of the patent right you have Ken Bass who is short who is shorting stock of pharmaceutical companies no because the because why because far, because the market pays attention to the fact that the PTAB has a kill rate ranging anywhere between 70% and 98% depending upon which program you're in and so if you if so if a patent is a primary part of your business model and you have a petition filed against you, big surprise, your stock's going to drop. Um, and so we, should be, we shouldn't be surprised that, you know, that sophisticated market actors have taken advantage of this. We have ex people with, I mean, and this isn't in doubt, there's explicit evidence of people filing petitions specifically to harass inventors, extortion of inventors, where, I mean, evidence was submitted saying, here's the letter saying, if you don't pay me $10,000, I'm going to file a petition against you at the PTAB. Um, that you know, sounds like an Article 3 problem. <laughs> yeah. No. yeah. Well, so, you have, one of the questions you have, we may and, ask yeah, so, of, uh, of you, Adam, is, yeah. you know, why are these Article 3 problems? Yeah. 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 Problems right. for Congress. Yeah. yeah, so, well, so, so what, no, what I'm trying to say is, yeah. is that you have a you have a you have structural problems at the PTAB, I think, okay. where the where the the um, the Supreme Court could still find the PTAB to be an uh, is unconstitutional violation of a cancellation of a private property right, and it could uniquely hold that this exists in the given the structure and the nature of the PTAB as it exists, as it was structured and created in the AIA. And and I think you've got, had a lot of interesting discussions and proposals about how Congress could fix that. And by the way, this happens all the time. Where where I mean, the bankruptcy happens. Stern v. Marshall, right? Where where they said, look, you created an unconstitutional regime because it interferes with private pr private rights, and and it throws it back into Congress's court to fix it. And they could potentially fix this by making it perspective, not ex ante, because there's Supreme Court precedent going back to 1843 McClurg v. Kingsland that you can't statutorily take away rights that are issued under pa previous patent acts that are now vested private property rights and they cited and relied upon as the quote well-established principles of this court end quote land patents and land rights um, to hold that for patents and so um, you know it's so that's why the analogy to cash is just is is is, is a bit strange to hear because the people who would disagree with that are people like Chief Justice Marshall, Justice Story, James Madison, uh, <laughs> many many others and so it's just a little odd to hear that analogy initially. All right. Um, you know, I think Don has to be able to give yeah. his full um, opening statement. <laughs> um, we will yeah. we will continue until four ten since we started late. So Don, don't feel under any pressure um, because we have plenty of time. No. Well, it's really fun to be here with all these IP mavens. I've learned a huge amount, um, and 
uh, because of my immense respect and affection for you, Artie, I will forgive you for having me be the last speaker <laughs> Friday afternoon at 4 o'clock. Um, well, me, the, it was the me, keynote Yeah, 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 I got that right. Yeah. Uh, so let me just uh, offer a few observations that are more general in nature. I mean, we've had a lot of really interesting discussion here about the PTAB and the way it operates and the patent system and the nature of a patent right and all that. And it may be that all of this gets brought to bear on the decision ultimately uh, that the court renders, but I don't think that's what this is about at all, um, at least as of this moment. It may evolve into that as the court digs in with the briefing, but you know, as Jonathan Massey said, and I completely agree with this, there's a, there's a very large scale movement going on in the Supreme Court to address the question of what's the proper relationship between the administrative state and the judicial branch. And it's played itself out mostly in the realm of how much deference under the Chevron doctrine uh, courts should give to administrative agencies' interpretations of law. Um, you know, one thing, I was just acutely conscious of this as SG, just watching this evolution. I argued a Chevron case, I think it was in January of 2013, City of Arlington versus FCC. It was a five to four decision upholding an agency action of Chevron deference. Justice Scalia wrote the opinion. It was the only opinion in five years that he wrote in a case that I argued uh, for the majority. Um, majority. And, and uh, for me, I guess I should say, he wrote some of the majority against me, but uh, for me, uh, it was the only one. Um, but there were four dissenters led by the Chief Justice, you know, who basically took issue with the fundamental premises of the, of the Chevron doctrine and the relation between courts and agencies. Uh, Justice Scalia has passed away. Justice Gorsuch has replaced him. He wrote this opinion that Jonathan mentioned in the Gutierrez-Brizuela case in the Tenth Circuit, in which he went even further than the Chief Justice did in his dissent in the FCC case and basically said this whole thing's completely out of whack, not only the relationship between the courts and administrative agencies in terms of interpreting uh, law, but uh, even uh, between Congress and administrative agencies, and that we need not only to get rid of Chevron, but to reinvigorate the non-delegation doctrine so that Congress does the job of actually specifying exactly what executive actors should do, and judges do the job of deciding whether what the executive actors have done uh, conforms to the law or not. And this case has plopped itself right down into the middle of that uh, fight, that, that discussion that's going on. Um, you know, and I don't think a lot of people saw it coming because everybody was focused on this idea of judicial review of agency action in the sense of what standards do you apply. But this case came along and it was, you know, it was like, whoa, it's, it's not only about that. Mm -hmm. It's also about this question of what uh, agencies can do and, and what courts can do. And to me, it wasn't entirely a surprise that this happened because there was a moment in oral argument, I'm embarrassed to say, I can't remember which of the patent cases was, one of the PTAB cases during my time as SG, and I was sitting there listening to the argument. And there's back and forth at the oral argument, and at one point the advocate made clear that the PTAB would have the authority to declare invalid a patent that a court had previously declared not invalid. And the Chief Justice's face screwed up and he got really, clearly got, he was clearly offended by that. You could just see it on his face. Um, and it was, I think, at that moment that a light bulb went off for the Chief Justice, at least, that there was an issue here, at least as far as he saw it. Now, having said all that and having described all these trends, and they're obvious from my description that they're moving in one direction, I guess what I would think about, what I, what I think about this case is that with these issues like the, the thought about reviving the non-delegation doctrine and with issues like uh, the question of whether uh, of whether the, the Article Three authority of the judiciary is being invaded. And I say this, you know, uh, my clerk for Justice Brennan, and, I, and, I, and I'm, I hope he will forgive me looking down from heaven for saying this, you know, uh, those opinions are not very comprehensible. They're extremely hard to apply. And, and so I think as with non-delegation, as with Article 3, a lot of times I think what happens is the court thinks there's an issue like they did in the Shore case and others, mm -hmm. and they get to the precipice and they look down and all they see is an abyss. And they decide, you know what, I'm going to back away from the precipice because 
The problem here, you know, maybe you can fashion opinions that focus on the particular qualities of the PTAB, and maybe you can fashion opinions that focus on the fact that there's something different about the grant here that's moved the, the patent from the public rights space into the private rights space such that it can't ever come back. And maybe that's different from other kinds of you know, post-grant examinations. You know, you are the experts in this stuff, I'm not. But, um, but boy, they're in, you know, they, take, they, they leap off that cliff and they don't know where they're gonna land. And one thing will be clear is that there are a lot more cases that will be coming their way uh, a lot more cases in the patent sphere, a lot more other kinds of cases. And I'm not sure that at least what I've seen so far in the briefing is giving them and would, would give them a significant degree of confidence that they could craft rules that could be applied in the future in a way that was going to be anything other than chaotic. And so, so I wonder whether really they're going to when they, they were going to jump off that cliff. So, um, Don, I want to ask you, and this truly is because I think that you're obviously the, the, the voice of extreme institutional uh, wisdom. <laughs> um, uh, do you think that they, if, if they were to jump off the cliff, they would craft a, a very different test than either the formalist or the functionalist tests they've used thus far? If, if, if there are five justices, say, who want to head in a very anti-administrative state direction. Yes, but I don't know what it would be. I think that's kind of part of the problem. Uh -huh. you know, it's just hard to see exactly what it would be. Um, particularly given, I mean, you know, betraying my sympathies to some extent here, but uh, particularly given some of the points that John Duffy made, I just think, you know, actually, how are you going to craft a test about invasion of the judicial prerogative that comes to terms with those and still strikes the, the, the provision down. I, and I just think that's a hard thing to do. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, so James, you have your hand up for a while. Just a very quick apology. One morning I was feeling way too clever, at, uh, well beyond my, my capabilities when I said, the PTAB should be doing some death squat. <laughs> <laughs> but I think no one will disagree with the proposition that if these cases arose and every patent had been determined to have been, have patentable claims, people would have said, what is the PTAB doing? It can't be that every patent was issued properly. Mm -hmm. So to have people now take that statement and presuppose that there was some pre-decision to go after the slaughter of patents and to talk about kill rates, I wonder about whether that might be language a little too extreme to the circumstance. Uh, let's see. Um, Dimitri and then uh, Peter Thurlow. So I have a couple of questions just for anybody on the on the panel. Just try to speak loud, loud, louder or the mic. Uh, so um, patent infringement, as you know, is also a creature of statute. You got 261 right to exclude to 71 to 81. So under the arguments that we've heard, what constitutional limit is there to the claim for patent infringement not having to be adjudicated in an Article Three tribunal, right, given that it's a cre creature of statute? The other question maybe goes to Don's couple of points is, is there an intermediate solution that can be crafted? So my concern in the brief that I filed has to do with finality and maybe dis district courts may not have to defer if there's been several years of proceedings and a jury verdict and so on. Maybe in that case, uh, a district judge in a parallel proceeding can decide um, can decide that uh, this the, the invalidation won't apply. Can the Supreme Court do that, given the question presented? Uh, John, John, one of the Johns. Okay, well, let's just call John and somebody else can talk. Yeah, go ahead, John. Cole. Okay, well, just on the on the first point, I mean, I think infringement uh, can be distinguished. Uh, is a claim of private liability between individuals. As I was trying to say before, validity is a question of the ability of the patent owner to have a government-issued right uh, to prevent other people from use of their otherwise lawfully held and used private property. So that's where I think you can argue there's a public right that's not talked about so much when you're just thinking that, that those are the general public uh, in order to, to, to use uh, their property and go about their lives without the encumbrance of uh, 
invalidly issued patent rights. So, so that I just thought I would respond to that point. I don't know if John's going to respond to that point. Or, or yeah, I was going to respond to that point. I do think infringement is different because the ca the classic calculate or statement of private rights is the the payment of or the the owing of money from one private party to another. So I think you know a lot of the arguments about it being private rights make sense if you're talking about infringement, but the predicate question of is this a valid patent, especially when, if you look at the way I do, is, it, it, you know, can the government switch the, the, the right from being a presumed valid to presumed invalid? If you look at it that way, that sounds very much like something that's built into the administrative state already. Um, it seems hard to say that that's some sort of conventional pre-existing private right. Um, so I wasn't sure what your second point was, and maybe somebody else had a response. question was on invalidation rates. I don't think that's possible because the if if the um, PTAB decision is not overturned in judicial review, then the then the agency issues a notice of cancellation, which I, I, I which means that under the statute, assuming the statute's constitutional, that means that the, there's no more patent right anymore. With respect to past infringement, like in the argument was made in translogic sort of petition way back. Oh, you could say it's only prospective. That's not really presented in the question presented. I think that that, I, I doubt they'd get, I think they've got enough on their plate, right? They've got yeah. the Seventh Amendment and Article Three, both of which are not clear areas. They, I think they will not reach out and decide new issues. <laughs> I put money on that one. <laughs> yeah. So I just want to thank, uh, is this on? I just want to thank Artie uh, coming to the end of the day. I really enjoyed the, the presentation. I've been practicing for 20 years. Um, have clients that are independent inventors, small businesses, large companies. Mm -hmm. I have the pleasure of, of being on a committee called PPAC, a Patent Public Advisory Committee, nine-member committee. Go back uh, many years ago with, with Judge Smith, uh, plenty of discussions about setting up the, uh, the practice and claim amendments and things, and we're still friends, so it's a good sign. <laughs> my, my concern with this panel, I guess, overall, was having practice and been in this area is that this case has nothing to do uh, about patent law. You know, just to kind of leave, like this is, I'm reading from the 2016 annual report for the, um, the patent office, and just, there's a few things, but I'll read one. It's IP intensive industries directly and indirectly supported 45.5 million jobs in 2014, uh, nearly one third of all US employment. From my perspective, dealing with all these companies, the importance of the intellectual property to all different shapes and sizes, this is critical. I surely wish that they, they took a bankruptcy case or something. <laughs> <laughs> but this is, Hans mentioned it. I, I, I kind of agree with Hans after all these hours, and I hope they throw it back and say we should have never taken this case. So, but thank you very much. Another hand? Uh, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. There are hands over here as well. I, oh. Yes, just a, a quick question. Um, has anyone thought about what the implications will be on the FCC? and allocation of spectrum? I, I have thought very briefly <laughs> about the mm -hmm. parade of agencies whose own processes will be affected. So I've, I've got a, a, a list that complements Melissa's. FCC reclaims spectrum licenses. Um, the Federal Aviation Authority reclaims landing rights. Um, lots of agencies have a Bureau of Correction-like function that's outside the courts. You Mostly subject to judicial review afterward that make, make them comparable, but in the first step, the agency is doing the work. I'll add one to that list, which is um, even though people are making these analogies to mining rights and other, you know, physical property rights, it, it is the <laughs> Supreme Court has has allowed the um, agencies to uh, with mining leases, which of course are property, right? I was taught that a lease is a, a piece of property. They've allowed them to be corrected. So even though there is some <laughs> Supreme Court precedent that said that the court can't, that the agency can't take back a grant in fee simple, they can re-grant, take back something that's just a lease. And, you know, lease is maybe 20 years long, right? So if you look at, like, what's a patent like? Is it more like fee simple? Is it more like a lease? I would say it's more like a lease, and then you'd have to rethink things like that, too. But the court said it's more like fee simple for the 20 years. So uh, <laughs> we have some hands over here. Yeah, Kevin. I have uh, three comments um, that will try to wrap up from end to beginning. First, 
Um, Don, the case you're referring to was Quozo, and it came after a long soliloquy between quote, um, Judge Chief Justice Roberts and, and, the, and the, the man who was arguing. And at the end, he said, he had that quizzical look on his face, and he said, that's a strange animal in the law, isn't it? And I wouldn't call it quizzical, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Angry. Yeah. Um, okay. But then, uh, to, to Adam's point about the inconsistencies and the morass that, you know, I don't know what that was the word you used, but basically that's a synonym, um, the board has been trying to gain consistency, and one of the ways that they were doing that was to stack panels to sort of force the law in a direction where there were splits. And if you don't have some way to rectify those splits, the Federal Circuit's not going to do it for you because they're not going to, uh, they're going to say that, that the board's decision and institution are final non-reviewable. Now maybe stacking panels isn't the right way to do it, which brings me to my last point is getting some changes in the law. and. Um, Judge Smith at the beginning suggested the Stronger Patents Act, maybe change the Pink Construction Standard and other ways we can change the law is one way of doing it. But another way to do it is, as Erica suggested, is clarify the law through notice and comment rulemaking, which I think would be a very good thing to do. The board under Director Lee had the PTAB reform initiative, which was sort of rescinded uh, when she left. And now hopefully Director Yanku will, will reestablish that. We'll get some more notice and comment rulemaking. And the PTAB will make some, some, some substantive changes without the sort of judicial rule making processes that they've used that haven't really been the best way of doing things. In, in addition to the stacking of panels, notice and comment rulemaking and statutes is probably the better way to go. Great, thank you, Kevin. Um, we have a bunch of additional hands um, back here. I think Todd and then Josh. Um, first of all, the, the retroactivity question, the desk squad question came up just to comment. Um, it's a little hard to beat the PTAB for killing patents uh, to beat out the Supreme Court, who's killed tens, if not hundreds of thousands, with their, I with their 101 jurisprudence. <laughs> um, my, my question is actually for, and not and a little tongue in cheek, but not a lot. Now that we do have a director nominated, uh, and the director is the principal IP policy advisor for the administration, shouldn't the Justice Department hold off for a while until that IP policy function is in place and make sure that the Trump administration agrees with whatever your brief is going to say uh, next month? They may differ from your point of view, and that might be uh, important. Uh, and you might say it applies to all cases, but here you've got uh, some known facts. And that would be an additional reason to maybe uh, have the court pull back for a year. Uh, can I just answer that? Uh, I want to make very clear. I have no view other than what the Trump administration's view is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there will be a, a confirmed solicitor general who will sign the brief that the United States files on September. There is a confirmed solicitor general. No, no I said there, the there confirmed is. solicitor general will sign the brief, yes. Yeah. So, uh, I one, it's, this is for Adam, and this is a little bit unrelated to all, to, to all of this, but... Let's just assume that uh, patents are full public, or sorry, full private property rights, similar to land grants. Would you then support mandatory recordation of all uh, transfers? Of all assignments? Of all assignments well, that, and transfers that, that of that was, right? Well, assignments are supposed to be recorded. Yeah, but they're not. There's I mean, nothing fact, mandatory about recordation yeah. for patents. Right. Yeah. There's been a huge fight about this, yeah. right? And the only thing that happens Assignment. if you don't record, and most patent owners don't record their new assignments if they're going to assert them, yeah. is uh, a bona fide purchaser problem, which only affects it if they specifically sell to someone else. So there's actually an incentive not to record that people have tried to deal with in the past. Exactly. Right. No, well, it was, it was, it you know, it was put into the patent statutes, the early patent statutes, that, that, that patents, that uh, transfer should be assigned, or I mean, assignment should be recorded. And that was in part, they were adopting title recordation from real property at the time, because they were saying, we need to treat this differently than how then, the, at, um, because John, you're exactly right. These were, this was enacted in the, in the context of an understanding of the abuses of the crown, just like our entire government was. And so they said, the English did it wrong. They treated this like monopoly royal privileges. These are property rights. We should have easy access to an institution that functions under the rule of law with title deeds that are publicly made available and title recordation with full assignment and, and licensing, which are terms from the common law for real property, of these property rights in the marketplace, which none of that you had in England. 
and the results are, 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 you know, the historical results, I think, speak for themselves. The, um, you know, unfortunately, I think the PTAB is taking us back to a system where, you know, you have, you know, where you, it's more being treated like privilege and, pre and treated through prerogative. And we don't have rule of law. And so this is the problem. Yes, you would be for man yeah, for, right? I said that, yeah. All right, uh, I think that Josh has the or last... Not mandatory, but because it's not mandatory for real property. There's no law that says you have to record. There's just consequences that follow from failure to record. So, they, I mean, the recording should be required... I, I don't, I, that I don't know. I can't, I'm not here to comment on that. Okay, so th I'm sorry Don had to leave because I think it goes to his uh, concern about the agency court struggle. So I'm going to channel Adam in response to John Duffy before <laughs> showing why that would be ridiculous. <laughs> right. And so remember that when you bring the action in the PTAB, the challenger can drop out and the PTAB still has the power to bring it forward. Right. So John's set of hypotheticals assumes that either in the court it's a challenger with Article Three standing already, or Congress can grant statutory standard for the APA claim, st statutory standing for the APA claim to someone who otherwise doesn't have it, who could. Uh, you know, so that's why it's a full substitute for the um, proceeding in the IPR. So I actually think that Article Three standing is a whole mess and unconstitutional for various reasons. But the key issue here is again. Is the public able to trigger this, the general public, not the specifically affected public? Uh, and I think that responds to both why Adam has a challenge and why that challenge is probably wrong. Last thing I'll say is on the idea that patents are always property rights that can't be taken away without compensation. Look at the U.S. versus Chemical Foundation case from World War I, where the government seized under the uh, alien property custodians' powers under the Trading with the Enemy Act, Swiss, not German, and we weren't at war with Switzerland, uh, patents, and then the court said, the Supreme Court said explicitly, no legislative obligation to compensate. So it seems like there's some kind of an odd property here if Congress can authorize the taking of property without any compensation. I'll leave it at that. I have a sort of follow-on Sure. If you can do, if you can indulge me for just one moment. Sure. Please. This goes, the, the issue of judicial review, I'd like to actually engage Adam directly and just say, could Congress um, or, the, or the Supreme Court mm -hmm. um, say the APA fully applies to the, to the grant of a patent, it's agency action, and it's subject to judicial review? Is that, is that constitutional in your view? And if so, could the agency seek a voluntary remand where they think one or more claims was not granted in, with reasoned decision making? Yeah. Well, I mean, didn't... Maybe I'm misreading Dickerson v. Zirko, but didn't they basically say in Dickerson? Well, the federal, the, circuit, the federal circuit has held to the contrary. With res the federal circuit has held in a case called Pregis versus Capos that mm -hmm. that that the Patent Act impliedly precludes judicial review yeah. as it's currently configured. Now, obviously, patent Congress could, could yeah. for patent grants. Right. So yes, they say the APA applies, but they say there's no judicial review under Section 701 to 706 for the grant of a patent, um, hmm. and that you know. I think that may be wrong as a matter of law, but it could be over, certainly could be overruled by Congress. Do you think that's unconstitutional? Because if it isn't, yeah, then I see, wonder what, what, what you do when the agency says, gee, we think one or more of these claims might be, uh, what might be invalid, so we're going to seek a voluntary remand, and then they start an administrative but, process. But, yeah. Well, but, you know, your, but your example shows how different the IPR process is from the courts. I mean, and, and we know that after Spokio, there has to be a concrete and particularized injury in order to have an Article Three controversy. Yeah, so but certainly simply, this, this claimant can't can Well, but, that. but I mean, so Ken Bass, when he's doing his short selling, you know, that can't create a, a, an, an Article Three controversy. And one of the problems, I think, with the IPR process is that it has generated, you know, a, a large number of reverse trolls where there would be no clear Article Three controversy. That's there not presented be. in this case. Right. It's both parties. No, but, yeah. but, but I'm just saying that you're, but the, the example that you're presenting shows the difference between IPRs and typical infringement actions because there isn't simply, Congress couldn't simply achieve, the IPR process is not a mirror of the of APA review. 
is what I'm trying to say. It, it is true that, that, at least with respect to this case, though, the parties all have standing and could seek judicial review. Correct, right. but, that's, but that's not the way the administrative process necessarily works. Necessarily works, but it's the way it worked in this case. So right. if, you, yeah. if you're going to have a... Although even in the Ken Bass circumstance, right, if, if the patent is impaired in any way, there would be an appeal, and then you could go to court. Yeah. So. I mean, this was, look, I mean, in, in the 1840s, Sorry, did you say that again? there was... In the Ken Bass situation? Oh, even in the Ken Bass situation, this, this is... <laughs> Kyle. Kyle. Oh, sorry, Kyle. sorry, excuse me, sorry, <laughs> Kyle Bass. Um, e even in that, so if, in the circumstance in which you have a party who does not have Article Three standing uh -huh. and commences an IPR, uh -huh. if the agency in any way impairs the patent right, then the patent owner has standing yes. and yes. you yes. can yes. go yeah. to a court. And yeah. so you can end up in court even though the Either original way. complaint could not have. Been. Yeah. That's a Sarko versus Kadish. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, this was this is my point about PTF as platypus, which <laughs> is that it's it, is that I you know it doesn't really fit into our understanding currently, our current understanding of administrative law in, in the APA and how it's functioning. Um, and moreover, to, to get back to kind of, I guess, your, your, the predicate of your question, I mean, in the 1840s, there was a great case. I'm, I'm, I apologize, I'm blanking on the name at the moment, with a uh, Supreme Court justice writing circuit where they were faced with an argument, an affirmative argument, that the public domain is a positive right that you can assert in court against a patent owner. And the, and the Supreme Court and the circuit, justice, the circuit justice just stomped on that and said, no, that's not a right that you can take into court. Um, you can't assert I am here on behalf of the public domain being hurt by this by this patent, right. and so and and I so I think that the, I think that kind of classic structure I think helps us understand how to address these types of issues. I mean, that was before the Declaratory Judgment Act was thought to be constitutional. I mean, people come yeah. to court all the time now and say I have an interest in this patent and it is, it is wrongly granted and. You know, uh, it should be held invalid. Yeah, if they're yeah. certainly if they're a competitor, they could yeah. they could have such yeah. a right. Yeah. And most invalid patents, because people widely know that they're invalid, they end up being useless patents, right? Every, you know, everyone may make great hay about the one-click. <laughs> oh, that's, that, that's, that's another. That. I think that's a whole another day of right. discussion. <laughs> <laughs> The, exercise, the exercising a cat with a laser pointer. No one's ever been concerned about that one. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think on that note. I want to thank a wonderful audience for your great interventions, the panelists for their fabulous, fabulous statements and discussion. And um, I hope that all of you, um, you know, have gained something from, from being here. Love to know any comments that you have regarding how this was structured, um, because we will, depending on how things evolve with this case, probably have what happened after the Supreme Court? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, so, so not, not Hillary Clinton's what happened, but what happened after <laughs> the Supreme Court decided. Um, and so if there are any improvements that you would suggest um, in this kind of format, I would appreciate hearing them. I'm rai at law.duke.edu. Um, panelists, please don't take off your microphones yet until you are allowed to do so by our AV team. And um, Thank you again for coming. Um, the webcast um, has been taped and it will be available in two weeks. So in case you missed any of the proceedings or you would just like to hear our fabulous uh, uh, presenters once again, um, it will be on our website, which is www.law.duke.edu slash innovation policy. Thank you again. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you, Maureen.